All right, well let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and the title of my message is Can You Lose Your Salvation? Have you ever heard of the Hope Diamond? It's described as the most perfect blue diamond in all of the world. It's one of the most valued gems on the planet with an estimated value of $250 million. Has an amazing history. Uh, it's been passed from various kings and queens. Uh, originally was in the possession of King Louis of France who gave it to Marie Antoinette. Catherine the Great had it for a time. I'm referring to my wife, of course. No. Um, <laughs> also King George of England had it and various other wealthy people. But yet despite its enormous value, one of the more eccentric owners of the Hope Diamond often strapped it to her pet dog's collar uh, while living in Washington, D.C. And apparently uh, she would often misplace it at parties and make a children's game of finding the Hope Diamond. Can you imagine such a thing? Well eventually it came into the possession of a diamond merchant named Harry Winston. He ultimately donated it to the Smithsonian Institute where it now sits. But here's the interesting thing. Harry Winston sent the Hope Diamond to the Smithsonian Institute in the U.S. mail, which is a dicey proposition to begin with, wrapped in a brown paper bag. Can you imagine being the person who's opening the mail that day? Oh, we have this. Oh, well, look at this. It's the Hope Diamond. Imagine something so valuable being so uncared for, being put on a dog's collar, lost at a party, and wrapped in a brown paper bag. Now it sits under lock and key in the Smithsonian Institute behind bulletproof glass. But I think there's something more valuable than the Hope Diamond that is often unappreciated. And I'm speaking, of course, of our personal salvation, an incredible gift that God gives to every person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Really, this is the greatest thing God has given to each of us, and often we take it for granted. There's a story in the Gospels of when the disciples went out and they were empowered by the Lord to do miracles and cast out demons. And when they returned from their trip, they were so excited and full of passion and told Jesus how demons came out at their command. And here's what the Lord said to them in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. He says, Don't rejoice that demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Guys, get perspective here. Get the big picture, which is this. You are saved. You are going to heaven. Nothing is more important than that. And that is why the Bible describes this as a great salvation that becomes ours when we believe in Christ. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, By grace we have been saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you recall that salvation includes something called justification that we explore together. Justification, which includes both the negative and the positive. It speaks of the removal of all of our sins that are now forgiven and forgotten. And it also speaks of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is placed into our spiritual bank account, if you will. And then in addition to that, because we're saved, we're also adopted into God's family. This is what God has done for us. And it's a wonderful thing. But now, as a result of receiving this salvation, I am told in Scripture to work it out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible does not say work for your own salvation. That's impossible. But work it out. Or another way to state it, work from your own salvation. Live it out. Play it out. Let it be applied in every area of your life. Okay, so when you believe in Jesus and you are saved, this is something God has given to you and you need to know that not only are you saved, but you also are safe. God protects and keeps his own children. Romans 8.38 says, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Death can't. Life can't. Angels can't. Demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. 
Whether we're high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are saved and we are safe. But now, hear this. God does not save anyone against their will, nor will He keep anyone against their will. You see, now that we have been saved, we should never presume upon the grace of God. We should seek to live as followers of Jesus Christ because it is possible for us to depart from the faith even as a believer. A writing to the believers there, uh, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 3.12, Beware brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That was written to believers, brothers. Don't depart from the living God. Warning believers about others that would lead them astray, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.17, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness and you're led away with the error of the wicked. Departing from the living God? Falling from our own steadfastness? So that brings us to the topic of the message, can a Christian lose their salvation? Once you are saved, can you become unsaved? Well, that's not an easy question to answer, but I'll take a shot at it. So are you ready? You might want to write this down. Can a Christian lose their salvation? My answer, I don't know. <laughs> it seems doubtful. But here's my question and follow up. Why would you want to push the envelope? See, here's what concerns me is there are people that want to know how they can be saved and still live as though they're not saved. They want to know that they're going to heaven, but yet they want to live like hell. They basically want to live in two worlds and want to know how much they can get away with and still technically be a Christian. That is a dangerous question and proposition to begin with. Because if you have really been saved, it seems as though your life should change dramatically. We're told in Titus 2, 11 to 14, the grace of God has been revealed bringing salvation to all people. So we're instructed to turn from godless living and sin sinful pleasures and we should live in this evil world with self-control, right conduct, and devotion to God while we look forward to the event when the Lord will return again because He gave His life for us to cleanse us from every kind of sin and to make us His very own people totally committed to doing what is right. Is that a description of your life today as a follower of Jesus? Are you totally committed to doing what is right in other words, if you've really been saved, there will be results in your life. What did Jesus say? Buy their Christian bumper stickers. You shall know them. No, I don't think so. Buy their Bibles. You shall know them. Well, it's great to have Bibles. Even that isn't enough. No, he said, buy their fruit. You shall know them. And people should be able to see spiritual fruit, changes in your life, that will indicate to them you are a true follower of Christ. For 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he is an altogether different kind of person. The old things have passed away. Everything becomes fresh and new. Is that a description of your life right now? Or are you one of those people that's trying to live in two worlds, in that in-between state? Here's what Jesus thinks about that. Writing to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, Jesus said, you are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So then, Christ says, because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. The message translation of the same verse goes as follows. I know you inside and out and find very little to my liking. You're not cold, you're not hot. Far better to be cold or hot. You're stale, you're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. That's kind of harsh. It's also quite accurate. That's exactly what Christ is saying. You know, it's just not working for me. This is not what I'm looking for. You're not one or the other. Reminds me of years ago, <clears throat> we purchased something called a backpack stroller. Now let me explain. 
For those of you that have traveled with children, you know how much baby hardware you have to take with you, right? Recently we traveled and took our whole family, our grandchildren, and I mean, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm bad enough with my computer and all that. You have to take your shoes off and your belt off and all the crazy things they make you do now. Uh, but then when you start coming through with all that baby stuff, you know, two baby car seats and a stroller or two, and uh, you know, I pity anyone who gets behind us, okay? So we were going on a trip years ago overseas and Jonathan uh, was a little guy at that point, I think maybe a couple years old. And so before I left, instead of taking a car seat and a stroller, I heard about this thing called a backpack stroller. So I bought it. But I didn't try it out first. And when I got over there, I realized I had bought a completely worthless item, the backpack stroller. Basically, the problem was it did neither well. <laughs> it was a lousy backpack and a horrible stroller. Because when I would put him in the backpack and put it on my back, it had these big wheels that dug into my back. <laughs> and then when I took it off and made it into the stroller, it didn't have back wheels, so he had to prop it up the whole time. So, you know, he's in there like this, and I'm like holding it like this. I'm going, this thing is worthless. So now we use that phrase for anything that doesn't work quite right. You know, ah, oh, it's a backpack stroller, you know. Sort of a point of reference. I think there's some backpack stroller believers, if you will. They don't do either well. They're not fully living for the Lord, uh, but they're partially in the world. Sort of like people that go into a place that specializes in coffee and they want a, a decaf low-fat latte. It's like, why? You know, I went into a Starbucks the other day with a person that ordered that. I won't say who Marty gets, but um, I said, all the fun is gone. Decaf, non-fat latte. You know, Jesus said that we are to be salt, and salt that has lost its savor is good for nothing. And there's a lot of Christians that are not salty. They're like decaffeinated Christians, okay? Uh, I think we need to decide what we want to do and not try to live on the edge, but try to be as close to the Lord as we possibly can. So can you lose your salvation? That's a hard question to answer, but here's a better question to answer in its, uh, ask in its place. Was this person even a Christian to begin with? See, sometimes they'll see a person, it'll appear as though they've made a commitment to Christ, but then after a period of time, they go back to their old life again and they never return again. So we ask the question, did they lose their salvation? Here's my question, did they have salvation to start with? Because it seems to me, if they go away and never return, they never were a Christian. See, I think we have to ask another question. Are we a prodigal or are we a pig? Now don't take offense to that. Understand, it's biblical. You've all heard the story of the prodigal son, right? How about the story of the prodigal pig? That's in the Bible too, 2 Peter 2.21. It says it would have been better for them if they had never known the right way to live than to know it and then reject the holy commandment that was given to them. They make these proverbs come true. A dog returns to its own vomit and a washed pig returns to the mud. There are many reasons I know the Bible is true. Two of them are in this verse. I have watched a dog return to its own vomit. Crazy animals. I mean, you know, you've, you've probably seen it too. And you know, they say, dogs have the cleanest mouths of all animals. I see people kissing dogs. Yeah, right. After he returned to his own vomit, he washes it down with toilet water and he wants to kiss you. And a pig returns to the mud. Now pigs are, are really amazing animals. They're great, especially next to egg. Um, <laughs> Love pig, <laughs> sausage, bacon, all of it. But very intelligent animals. Some have even made pigs into pets. Uh, I know a person that has two dogs, three cats, and a pot pig. Enough about her husband. Um, <laughs> whoa, tough crowd, tough crowd. But I don't know if a pig's really a great pet. I was doing a little research on pigs and found out they like to eat some pretty strange things like a tree bark, rotting carcasses, 
garbage, and even other pigs. According to this article, in captivity, pigs are known to eat their own young if they're stressed out. What stresses out a pig, you know? <laughs> and the reason that pigs like to hang out in mud is because they don't have sweat glands and that's how they cool themselves. Just as a dog will cool himself by panting, a pig will cool itself by embedding themselves in mud. And they also sunburn easily and that's why they spend time in the mud. So you can take a pig and you can try to domesticate it and you can put sunscreen all over it, you know, and put some little sunglasses on it and, and uh, put some perfume on it and a cute little hat if you want to. And you know, the first chance that pig is gonna get, he's gonna make a beeline to the mud. Why? Because a pig is a pig. Just as surely as a horse is a horse, of course, of course, <laughs> unless of course it's a talking horse. <laughs> what was the name of that TV program? That's right. Oh, Wilbur. <laughs> All the young people are like, what? <laughs> the old people are like, yeah, old Mr. Ed loved him. <laughs> but a pig is a pig. It does what it does. So here's how to tell if a person is a believer or not a believer. A believer, even when they go astray, will always come home again to the Lord, and a non-believer won't. So the big question that comes up is how do they end up? You see here's what 1 John 2, 19 says. They went out from us but they did not really belong to us for if they had belonged to us they would have remained with us but their going out showed they never really belonged to us. So when we look at people that look as though they have fallen away and we even wonder if they've lost their salvation I suggest they were not even saved to begin with because the true test is where you wind up. Where you wind up. My own mother was raised in the church. She made a profession of faith as a young girl uh, living there in Friendship, Arkansas. My Aunt Willie has told me all about it. But yet my mom rebelled against her faith and rebelled against her upbringing. But she always believed, but she didn't live it. And at the very end of her life, my mom came back to the Lord and made a recommitment. And I believe she's in heaven. She's passed on now. But uh, she was a prodigal and a long-term prodigal. I guess the big question is where do you end up? See, this is what happens when a person backslides. And anyone can backslide. Now, no one usually plans on doing it. You don't call up your Christian friend and say, hey dude, want to backslide tonight? <laughs> Pick you up at nine, it'll be so cool. No, you don't do that. But what you do is you start making little compromises that lead to big compromises and next thing you know, you're not in a place you should be. The Bible even tells us one of the signs of the end times, according to 1 Timothy 4.1, is some would depart from the faith. It could happen to you, it could happen to me, if precautions are not taken. I suggest to you there are people that are backslidden that aren't even aware of it because they don't understand what the term backslide means. It's a biblical term. Jeremiah 3.22, God says, return faithless people and I will cure you of backsliding. Jeremiah 2.19 says your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. You might say, well I don't really know that I've actually backslidden. But here's something to think about. The Christian life is one of progression. It's one of growth. And it's one of constant change. You are either moving forward as a believer or you are moving backwards. You are either gaining ground or you are losing ground. So my question today is, are you moving forward? Because if you aren't, you are potentially backsliding. You might protest and say, hey man, I'm still a Christian. I still go to church when I feel like it. I still read the Bible if it occurs to me. I still obey God unless it conflicts with something I want to do. Now here's the problem. You are not where you once were and you're slipping away. And that is why we need to take practical precautions because listen to me now, anybody can fall away from the Lord. Anybody can depart from the faith. I don't care how long they've been a Christian. I don't care how much of the Bible they've memorized. I don't care if God's even spoken through them and used them. You could fall away. I could fall away. Anyone could fall away. And the moment we begin to doubt that is the moment we're taking a step toward doing it. Let's look now 
in the time that we have left at a man that had a famous backslide, if you will. A man that was one of the hand-picked disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and spent three concentrated years of walking and talking with Jesus. A man that was not only part of the 12, but he was part of the three. Yes, Simon Peter was one of the 12 apostles, but he was also singled out by the Lord along with James and John for special mission. So this guy had incredible exposure to what was right and what was true, but of course we also know that Peter fell away from the faith. Why? Let's see if we can find out together as we look at Luke chapter 22. Let me sort of set the scene. We're in the upper room. The ministry of Christ is now coming to this great crescendo of when he is going to go to the cross and die for the sin of the world. He knows this is coming. He's predicted it. He's spoken of it. And now in the upper room he's there with his disciples and he turns to Peter and says this, Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has been asking for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day, before you will deny three times that you know me. We'll stop there. Imagine this. You're just chilling with Jesus, and he turns and says this, Satan has been asking for you by name. From the original Greek it can be translated this way, Simon, Simon, Satan has been asking excessively that you would be taken out of the care and protection of God. I don't know that I've ever been tempted by the devil himself. Let me explain. When we're tempted to do wrong, it is the devil behind it, but you know the devil can only be in one place at one time. Sometimes we falsely think Satan is sort of God's equal. You know, whatever God can do, Satan can do. For instance, God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. Therefore, the devil is too. Not true. The devil is a powerful spirit being, but he can only be in one place at one time. So when we say we're tempted by the devil, it was probably a demon doing his dirty work. But in this particular instance, the devil, Satan, Lucifer himself come pers comes personally calling for Peter. He actually says to Jesus, I want the fisherman. I want him bad. I want you to give him to me. And so Jesus reveals this to Peter. Man, that have you shaken in your sandals. <laughs> hey, guess what? Satan's been asking specifically for you by name that you would be taken out of the care and protection of God. And then the Lord says, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned, you will strengthen your brothers. See, that's the great comfort that we have, is knowing that Jesus is interceding for us. Christ is praying for us. Romans 8, 34 says, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, was raised to life. He is at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. Listen, if it were not for the intervention and intercession of Jesus, none of us would make it. Robert Murray McShyann made this statement and I quote, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, yet distance makes no difference he is praying for me, end quote. And a great quote. Christ is praying for you. Now let's look at the first step to Peter's fall. It was self-confidence. If you're taking notes, it's up here on the screen. Self-confidence. We find this in uh, Luke 22, verse 33 to 34. Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus says, I say to you, the rooster will not crow this day before you deny three times that you know me. Another detail is given to us in Matthew's Gospel where Peter said, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Why did he make this statement? Because Christ had revealed that Judas Iscariot was about to betray him. So Peter thought this would be a good opportunity to boast of his commitment, even comparing himself to others. Hey, even if all are made to stumble. I mean, imagine here's, you know, Matthew is James and John and Bartholomew just sitting there. Even if all are made to stumble, even if these guys, Peter is saying, let you down, 
You can depend on me, Jesus. Don't forget, you gave me that nickname, Rock. I'm a rock, Lord. I won't let you down no matter what. I'm always suspicious of anyone who makes themselves look better at someone else's expense. If you find someone that has to cut down others to lift themselves up, something is wrong. Another thing is, I don't think we should ever boast of our love for God, but rather boast of His love for us. Oh Lord, I love you so much, I'll never let you down. Peter, you don't know yourself. You think you love the Lord, I think I love the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying it, but I would rather talk about how much God loves me. John the Apostle described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You see, my love is inconsistent. My love is fickle. His love is flawless. His love never stops. Peter's boasting of his dedication, boasting of his commitment. And Mark's Gospel tells us he did this repeatedly. It was self-confidence. And the Bible warns, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Just when you think you're not going to fall, you're in greater danger of falling. It's interesting to note that some of the great men of the Bible who were known for certain things fell in those very areas. For instance, when you think of Elijah, what comes to mind? Courage, standing up with the prophets of Baal, challenging them to a duel that is won as he calls upon the name of the Lord. How about walking into the court of Ahab and Jezebel, the king and queen of Israel, and saying it will not rain but according to my word. But yet we read later in Elijah's story of how he ran and hid in a cave because Jezebel put a contract out in his life. The man of courage hiding in fear. Or how about Samson, known for his superhuman strength where he could kill Philistines with whatever bone or object happened to be laying on the ground at the time, but yet Samson is brought down in immorality. How about Abraham? We know him for faith, but yet on at least two occasions he lied saying that his wife Sarah was a sister out of fear of what would happen to him. See, here's what it comes down to. Sometimes the areas you fall in, fall in are the areas where you think you're the strongest. You see, if you know you're weak in a certain place, you'll keep your guard up there, but if you think you're strong in another place, you'll lower your guard. Listen to this. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. Think about that. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. I may watch out in the area of vulnerability, but lower my guard in the area where I think I'm strong, and that might be the place that I will fall in. So be careful. Lord, even if all are made to stumble, I will never be made to stumble. Step number one, self-confidence. Let's look at step number two. Go back to Luke 22 starting in verse 54. Let me fill in a gap. After the upper room, they went to the garden in Gethsemane. There Jesus sweat as it were great drops of blood as he contemplated the horrors of the cross. He asked Peter, James, and John to stay awake with him. They fell asleep because of sorrow. And he said, oh, couldn't you stay awake with me? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The guards come in, temple police, arrest Jesus. Peter pulls out his sword, starts swinging. He cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant who's named Malchus. Jesus tells them to put that sword away. Heals this man. And the Lord is taken away in chains before the high priest. So now outside of the courtyard of Caiaphas, people are gathering and Peter joins them. Let's read Luke 22, verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him to the high priest's house and underlined this phrase, and Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man also was with him. And he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. After a little while, another saw him and said, you are also one of them. Peter said, I am not. After about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this one was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. 
Step number one to Peter's fall was self-confidence. Step number two was following at a distance. Following at a distance. He was still following, but at a distance, non-committal. In his defense, that's more than what others could say, but it was a half-hearted commitment. And there's a lot of people like this today. They follow at a distance. They still have a foot in the church, but they have a foot in the world as well. Which brings us to step number three, hanging out with the wrong people. Number one, self-confidence. Number two, following at a distance. Number three, hanging out with the wrong people. In verse 56, we find Peter warming himself at the fire. The fire in the courtyard of Caiaphas, who was trying Jesus. The fire that was surrounded by non-believers. We might call it the enemy's fire. At this point, Peter is worn down, defeated. He's weak. He's vulnerable. This is the last place he should have been. But Matthew's Gospel tells us that he sat down with the guards to see the end. He was resigned now to the fate of Jesus. Nothing he felt he could do. He's just sitting there. Listen, Peter was with the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time about to do the wrong thing. And when you hang around with the wrong people in the wrong places, you're gonna end up doing the wrong thing. I hope that doesn't come as a revelation to you. But it happens. That's why we need to give a lot of thought to who we spend the bulk of our time with. We think we're influencing them, but the question is, are they influencing us? We think that we're pulling them up, but the real issue may be that they're pulling us down. That is why Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the word of the Lord, and in it does he meditate day and night. Have you ever noticed the progression or shall I say, the regression of words in someone. Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners, sits in the seat of the scornful. First he's walking, then he's standing, then he's sitting. Sort of like you on a diet. I don't mean you in particular, any of us. Though I am thinking a couple of you might. Just hear what I'm saying. Anyway, so we're on a diet and we have our favorite bakery. And I don't know about you, but I have a weakness for anything baked, you know. Uh, I like sweets, you know. I enjoy chocolate with the best of them. In fact, the problem is whenever I, I eat chocolate, I <laughs> I'm laughing because I wrecked this joke. Um, Scott Wood, a professional comedian, is here with us today. And he gave me this joke and I just wrecked it. So I wanted to say, Scott, sorry I wrecked your joke. Here's what I was supposed to say. I'm allergic to chocolate. I break out in fat. <laughs> I didn't think it was that funny either. Um, <clears throat> so anyway. But uh, anything that is baked is a temptation to me. You know, someone said to me the other day, uh, you ought to try a Dove Farm. They're great. And you know, it's the worst soap I've ever eaten. I don't know what they were talking about. <laughs> Another Scott Wood joke. Okay, no more Scott Wood joke. Okay, so. You know, something that's baked, it tempts me. A, a guy, this is not a joke now, this is a true story. Some, a pastor from, uh, North, uh, not North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, sent me uh, some biscuit mix the other day. He knew I liked biscuits. He said, these are the best biscuits ever. So it came to our house with some fresh preserved strawberry. And I was looking at that. I'm not much of a cook. So I said to my son, Jonathan, why don't you make some biscuits? He's actually a good cook. He'll try stuff I'd never try. So he made a batch and they were fantastic. Then I told my wife, you gotta try these biscuits. So we made some more. Then we made some more. We went through the entire bag. <laughs> then it was on their website, must order more. <laughs> no, don't order. This is, could be my downfall. See, I can resist certain things, but man, if it's freshly baked bread or biscuits, I'm weak. I don't know about you. We all have our areas of weakness, right? So you're walking by your favorite bakery. You knew it would be there. You're on your new diet. First you're walking, then you're standing, then you're sitting in the vat of dough, eating raw dough. <laughs> so you set yourself up. Peter was with the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time, and he did the wrong thing. Bringing us to his fourth step down, his first denial of Christ, verse 56, a servant girl saw him and said, 
You're one of them. You're one of the followers of Jesus. He denied him. Woman, I don't know him. By the way, John's Gospel tells us that one of these people who recognized Peter was related to the servant of the high priest whose ear Peter cut off. Your sin will find you out. So here's denial number one. You would have thought that Peter would have said, whoa, wait, hello. Where did I hear this? Oh yeah. Jesus said in the upper room, I would deny him. I gotta get out of here. But no, you see, he's already been beaten down. Now he's getting ready to offer up denial number two. Number five, verse 58. After a little while another psalm and said, you're one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. I want you to notice a little while had passed. He could have left this place, but he stayed there even longer. And that brings us to denial number three. And step number six down, he came to his third denial. Verse 59. After an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed saying, this man was with him. He's a Galilean. Peter said, I don't know what you're saying. Now he's busted. Third time's a charm. Now wait a second. You're one of them. No, I'm not. No, no, no. You got the Galilean accent. Get out of here. What did that mean? It meant that back in those days, just as we have certain accents in different parts of our country, someone who comes from New York has a distinct accent. Someone who comes from Boston has an accent. They don't have the word R in Boston. They park the car. (laughs) If you're from New York, I want a cup of coffee. It's coffee, you know. In the South, it's, hey, y'all, how y'all doing? You can tell where they're from. People tell me I have an accent in different parts of the country when I travel. You have a California accent. I go, there's no California accent. (laughs) You're the ones with accents, not me. No, you have the California accent. I'm not sure what it is. I think that they expect us to talk like, you know, caricatures of surfers. Hey, dude, seriously, man, you know. (laughs) I don't speak that way, but still, to some I have a California accent, whatever that is. And there was a Galilean accent, and Peter had it. And really this was a way of putting a person down, you know, the more cultured, affluent, educated uh, Jerusalemites Look down upon those who are from the more rural area of Galilee. Uh, It it might be like calling someone a country bumpkin or, oh man, you're trailer trash. What do you know? You have the Galilean accent. You're not even from around here. I know you. And then Peter offers his third denial. And this thing is radical, what he did, because Matthew's gospel tells us in the third denial, he began to curse and swear. Now does this mean that Peter uttered a string of profanities? That he swore like a sailor? Well, he was one, at least a fisherman. I don't think that's specifically what is being said because this term that is used here for curse is a very strong expression that involved pronouncing death on oneself at the hand of God if he were lying. So instead of simply using a profanity, and the most radical demonstration of taking the Lord's name in vain that is imaginable, Peter essentially said, I swear to God I never knew Jesus. I take an oath before God I was never one of the followers of Jesus and the rooster crows. How did he get this far down? And then look at what the verse says, verse 59, immediately While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine that scene? How dramatic is that? To actually deny the Lord, hear the rooster, and make eye contact with Christ. God in human form looking into your soul. And by the way, that phrase that says Jesus looked at Peter could be better translated, Jesus looked right through Peter. Have you ever had someone look right through you? Let me restate the question. Do you have a mother? (laughs) You know how it goes. Where have you been? Oh, nowhere. Look at me. What? Look at me. Where have you been? I'm going to ask you one more time. Where have you been? You start confessing things you didn't even do. Jesus looked right through Peter. 
What kind of an expression do you think it was? Do you think it was a look of anger? Like rolling his eyes? What an idiot. Why'd I ever choose you? No, I don't think so. Because Jesus predicted this. Jesus knew it was coming. What did Peter do after Jesus looked at him? He went out and wept bitterly. If someone looked at you with anger, I don't know that you would go out and weep bitterly. I think if someone looked at you with love and compassion, you would. Because it'd break your heart. I think Jesus looked and just, I love you, man. And Peter went, oh, how could I have done that? He, he just thought, it's over with. I've ruined everything. I could never be used by God. I've lost everything. He probably doubted he was forgiven from his sins and all the rest. So here's the question. Did Simon Peter fail? Yes. Did he fail big? Without question. Did he openly deny the Lord? Yes. Three times as a matter of fact. Was he still a believer? Oh yeah. He was still a believer. You see, he needed to remember something else Jesus said to him. After he said, you'll deny me three times, he says, and after you have returned, you will strengthen your brothers. Peter, you're gonna make it back. You know why? Peter wasn't a pig, he was a prodigal. And he came to his senses and he returned to the Lord. And it shows that there are second chances for any person who has ever failed God. And that really shows where we're at. Now here's my question for you. Are you a prodigal today or have you backslid? Now if I would have asked you that question at the beginning of the message, your knee-jerk reaction would have been, well of course not. I'm at church, aren't I? But now as we've learned a little bit more about what it means to backslide, and we've learned that it not only means to just go into sin, but it means to start letting go and go backwards, and it means to fail to progress, we realize that some of us actually might be in a process of backsliding. We actually might be a prodigal. So let's say that you are falling back a bit. Let's say that you've slipped a bit. Let's say that you've lost some ground. How do you get back right with God? There's three R's I'll give to you in closing. And they're found in the book of Revelation chapter two. When Jesus speaks to the church of Ephesus, he commends them for their hard work and their discernment. He says, I know you try those that say they are apostles and are not, but I have something against you. You have left your first love. Then he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works quickly. The three R's, remember, repent, repeat. First I have to remember. Hey, you know, there was a time when my commitment to Christ was stronger. There was a time when I was walking more closely with Him than I am today. Remember, it's a point of reference. Number two, repent, change your direction. Stop doing what you're doing and go back to doing what you were doing before, which brings us to repeat. Let's illustrate. Let's say that your marriage is in trouble. Let's say it's unraveling. Let's say you don't even know if you're gonna make it through this year. You say there's nothing that can be done to save my marriage. Oh yes there is. You can get your marriage back where it needs to be. You need to get romance in it again. Well, how do you get romance back in your marriage? You do romantic things, right? What did you, what did you used to do when you took your wife out? Before she was your wife, husbands, what did you do for her? Well, I, first of all, took a shower. Nice. <laughs> Good start. Then what? Took her, you know, Took her out to a restaurant, okay. Yeah, opened the door of the car for her, good. Opened the door of the restaurant for her, nice. Pulled the chair out for her, good. I still do that, kind of. I open the door, I just close it before she's all the way in and <laughs> pull the chair out, I just don't put it back in and when she falls on the ground I point and I laugh. Yeah, we need to stop doing that. So be romantic again. Tell her how beautiful she is. Tell her you love her. Give her a gift. Those little things matter. What if I don't feel it? Do it anyway. Because it's the right thing to do. Go back and do the first things again. So let's come back to our relationship with God. Okay, well I've lost the romance, if you will, of my relationship with Christ. What do I do? Remember from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works quickly. What did you used to do as a Christian that you're not doing now? Well, every morning I would get up and read the Bible. Good, do that again. What else did you do? Well, I, I prayed a lot. Good, start doing that too. What else? 
Went to church, went on Sunday, went to a midweek Bible study, uh, loved to read Christian books, listen to good Christian radio teaching programs. Do that stuff too. What else did you do? Well, I tried to look for opportunities to share the gospel. Do that as well. What if I'm not feeling it? Do it anyway. It doesn't say do it if you feel it. Remember, repent, repeat. This isn't rocket science. If you're not going forward, you're going backward. And when you start neglecting those spiritual disciplines and you stop thinking about spiritual growth and you start caring about becoming more like Jesus, you'll be just fine. And you won't be standing around asking yourself, have I lost my salvation? But instead you'll be saying, I need to work this out and live it out. But for the person that's on thin ice and they're living on the edge, and they're hanging out with the wrong people, and they're doing the wrong things, they're wondering, what, am I even saved? I don't know, are you? If you are, there should be some results in your life.